In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this morning. I have to admit, it feels a little strange standing up here in this great pulpit, looking out at an empty cathedral. Now, I've preached sermons before that fell so flat it felt like the place was empty, but this, this is a first. Matt, can you give people at home the view of the camera from the west balcony so folks can see what it's like this morning? We miss you here amongst us, although we know that you are here with us. So thank you for joining us for worship this morning. I love the story that you may have seen um, in the news about the Italian priest who printed out photos of his parishioners and taped them to the pews in his church. Seeing all his flock gave him comfort while it reminded the community that even though they were physically apart, they were together in spirit, together as the body of Christ. The truth is this cathedral may be empty this morning, but I have no doubt that this gathering across the internet and around the world is a community as real and as important as if we were all sitting together today. Because even though we are far apart, we are bound by the Spirit, bound together by a force greater than any distance and stronger than any separation. Isn't that a great picture? It was sent to me by some cathedral friends worshiping with us earlier this week in San Francisco. It looks like someone got the Spirit. So wherever you are today, thank you for being with us and remember that this cathedral is your cathedral. So how are you doing? I pray that you are well and safe and sound. How are you holding up during these days of staying at home and social distancing? I heard someone say the other day that we're about three weeks away from knowing everyone's true hair color. And I know that during these days at home, I've been eating way too much, changing out of my sweatpants far too infrequently, reading a lot, watching way too much Netflix, and silly dog videos. And speaking of, while I'm blessed to have our family around me and we're being very careful. I have to confess that my dog Lady is a complete failure when it comes to social distancing. She loves having all of us at home and she has become a 60 pound lap dog. Let's be honest. This is a strange time. It's a stressful time. It's a frightening time. It's a time of waiting and worrying and watching. As the psalmist says this morning, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for the Lord. More than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. My soul waits for the Lord. Every day on the news, we see more people getting the virus and more people losing their lives to this terrible disease. We hear stories of overcrowded hospitals, people losing their jobs, businesses closing, and the economy shrinking. And we're forced to wait, forced to stay away from each other, not only to protect ourselves, but to protect the most vulnerable among us. And in the midst of all this, we have to cope with the fact that we We don't know when this pandemic will end. We know that it will end, but not when. There's no date certain, so it feels like we are stuck in a kind of limbo, waiting, watching, and worrying. Now, for those of us who call ourselves Christians, we are part of a faith that is all about hope. 
We are part of a faith that knows the reality of suffering and loss and yet proclaims that even in the midst of the most difficult times, there is always the promise of new life, of life that defeats death, of a love that binds all things together and conquers even our worst fears. Our readings from Ezekiel and from John today are both lessons of hope. Lessons that point to God's deeper purposes at work during moments of stress and fear and loss. At a time when so many of us feel as if we are disconnected and brittle as dry bones, the prophet Ezekiel gives us a wonderful vision of a God who not only gives life, but a God who restores life. Writing to the Hebrew people in exile 600 years before Jesus was born, Ezekiel tells his people that they may feel disjointed. They may feel far away from home. But God's spirit will breathe new life into Israel and bring them all together again. They are promised that there is nothing God cannot redeem. And they are told that the Lord has not forsaken them. Many of us have heard this reading all our lives and sung more times than we can count that great old spiritual about Ezekiel connecting dem dry bones. But perhaps today our current situation will enable us to hear Ezekiel's words in a new way, in a personal way because we too are disconnected from one another, experiencing our own kind of exile from our normal lives. And the good news is that in this, in this present valley of dry bones, God's promise of life restored is as true now as it was all those years ago. Indeed, my friends, the Lord has not forsaken us. In a similar way, our gospel reading this morning reminds us that as Christians, we proclaim a faith that is unique among the vast majority of the world religions. Unique because we worship a God who is not distant and otherworldly, but a God who takes on our flesh, who becomes one of us, a God who becomes human and walks among us and experiences firsthand the joys and the sorrows of this life. And so we see this morning how much Jesus loved Lazarus and that he wept at his friend's death. Because of this, we can take comfort in the fact that Jesus understood and understands our grief, our worry, our sense of loss during these difficult days. In fact, my friends, I think we are supposed to see ourselves in Lazarus, whose name literally means God helps. As Alice McKenzie writes, Lazarus represents all those who Jesus loves, which includes you and me and all humankind. This story is a story about our coming to life from death in this present moment and not just in the future. Friends, I hope you realize that the same spirit that moved over the earth at the instant of creation, bringing life out of nothingness, the same spirit that reanimated Ezekiel's dry bones, the same spirit that came to rest on Jesus at his baptism, the same spirit that brought Lazarus up from the grave, this spirit is present and working amongst us right now. We can see it. We can see it in the sacrifice and the service of so many thousands of healthcare professionals and first responders around the world who are freely risking their own lives to care for the sick and those in need. We can see it in the restaurants around this country who are helping to feed children stuck at home who cannot receive the school meals on which their families depend. We can see it in the GoFundMe drives to support 
hourly workers and to raise money for protective gear for hospitals. We can see this same spirit at work in the person who, after enjoying a $90 meal, left more than $9,000 in tip to help the employees who would otherwise be out of a job. We can see it locally in organizations like Feed the Fight right here in D.C. and in other cities who have partnered with local restaurants and they have funded and delivered more than 700 meals in Washington to local hospitals to help feed all those serving on the front lines. We can even see the spirit at work when a cathedral finds more than 5,000 protective masks literally hidden away in a crypt space intended for a casket. Now there is life out of death. Masks that now help protect doctors and nurses at two of our Washington hospitals. Friends, in a few days, we will all be entering into the holiest days of the Christian year. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday and the beginning of Holy Week. These are the days in the life of the church when we are reminded that while suffering and death are real, we worship a God who not only walks with us and suffers with us, but we have a God who loves us enough to always bring us through death into new life. These are the promises, the hope, that lie at the heart of our faith. So as we move through these last days of Lent, remember that God is not done with us. God's Spirit is working in our midst. God's promises are as real for us this morning as they were for Ezekiel and Lazarus so many years ago. Now in conclusion, I. I wish I could say something to you this morning that would take away the worry, take away your fear, but I can't. There are some things that we just have to go through. But I do know this. We are all in this together and we will come through this struggle to see better days. So say your prayers and keep the faith. Say your prayers and fight the fear. Say your prayers and share God's love wherever and however you can. Amen.